Aloha, welcome to Condo Insider, our Hawaii show about association living. This is kind of an important week for us because as of last week, if the bills before the legislature hadn't got out of its final committee, they were dead. So uh, since we've seen you last, or you've seen us last, um, two bills have died. One was the bill that would eliminate the board majority from being an option on the proxy each year. That bill is now deferred. And then was the bill where they were looking at allowing board members or board of directors to establish house rules, making the entire building not smoking. And that too didn't get a hearing or get out of the last committee. So it too is dead. I have with me my good friend, Jane Sugimura from Hawaii Council Community Associations. We're sitting here kind of chagrined today because one of the most important bills before our legislature is Senate Bill 551. And it has passed through the committees, although some of the amendments are very objectionable. And it's going to what we call conference committee between the House and the Senate to see if they can iron out the differences in the two bills, come to an agreement so it goes to the floor and then to the governor. So welcome again to the show. Well, thank you for having me. Tell them, this review, everybody, what SB 551, the original intent was. Okay, the original intent of Senate Bill 551 uh, was to uh, address uh, a, a, an appellate court decision, the SACL uh, decision, that basically held that when the legislature uh, made an amendment to Chapter 514BA, back in 1999, which allowed uh, uh, associations to do non-judicial foreclosures. Uh, and, and, and technically, what we're talking about is, you know, uh, power of sale language that appears in mortgages. And, uh, you, and, and because it's between the lender and the borrower, I mean, it's an enforceable agreement. And in this situation, the legislature, and, and just to give you the backstory, it, it, during, in, in 1999, the associations were faced with a situation where th there was a recession, there was this backlog in circuit court. And so if you did a foreclosure, it took you over a year to complete it because it took you six to eight months to even get an initial hearing on the foreclosure. And then after you had that uh, uh, motion, which allowed you to do the foreclosure, you had to wait another six to eight months to get a motion to confirm the sale. So it was taking, you know, uh, 12 to 14 months, 16 months to even complete a foreclosure. And that meant associations, you know, really could not recover on their maintenance fees. That's what foreclosure is all about. People don't pay their maintenance fees. They get sued by the association. And so, uh, and there was, a, uh, there was a law in effect before 1999 that allowed uh, for, um, non-judicial foreclosures associations to do it but what happened just before you know, the year before the the change that uh, resulted in the controversy that we're dealing with uh the legislature changed the language so that you couldn't use it i mean they they put language in the uh the non-judicial foreclosure bill that said that basically if you're the uh association you had to get the debtor's signature on the final document and in most cases, when you do a foreclosure, by the time you get to the end, the unit owner, the debtor, is long gone. And even if he was around or she was around, they're not going to sign you know, this document, making it official. And so it was useless. And so we went back to the legislature, and I was there. And, uh, and, uh, we, and, and we told the legislature, you know, the associations are facing financial hardship. We can't recover on our maintenance fees because it takes us so long to do these foreclosures, we need some relief. And they added language into the statute that said that condo condominiums could do use the power of sale foreclosure uh, without having a contract with it, you know, that, that it could be just in the statute. It didn't have to be in their uh, governing documents. And so uh, they were allowed to do the non-judicial foreclosures, uh, which is a foreclosure that is not supervised by the court. And, and then they were able to, uh, you know, sell the, the unit and basically take it back. And, 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 and most typically, they bought it back for a dollar because these units 
when you're the association, you take subject to the first mortgage, right? So the unit is relatively worthless because the first mortgage has got priority. And so they would basically do the non-judicial foreclosure to get the unit so that they could rent it. At least this way, when you get a tenant in, you have a tenant who's paying the maintenance fees, you know, so that the, and, and what happens if you don't have people paying their fair share of the maintenance fees? If you have, let's say 10 people in a building who don't pay their maintenance fees, the other people who live in the building end up subsidizing them because the condominium budget is, uh, is a zero sum uh, budget. In other words, you make a budget and, and, and you, you, you uh, put enough money in the budget to, uh, to cover all of your expenses for that one year. So if you have people who aren't paying, that means the other people who do pay end up subsidizing the non-payees. Well, before I say this, let me just say that I had a project on Maui that was approximately 64 units, primarily owned by second owners in the mainland, but then you had the economic crisis hit. And... 31 of the units walked away from their units. And they lived on the mainland. So that means a 31 of 64, almost half the budget and that was is, gone. That's your cash flow. If you're not yep. getting money from half of the unit owners, how do you pay for the electricity well, and the water and the, the well, staff? Let me, and well, Let me tell you how they did it. They did what they call a cash flow assessment. And they assessed everybody another 40% of their maintenance fees on a monthly basis until they could do a non-judicial foreclosure, which in turn, then they got possession of the unit subject to the mortgage, mm -hmm. which time then they could get a tenant. And as those tenants started taking hold of these units that they got non-judicial, the amount of cash flow necessary was reduced, so the eventually the cash flow assessment was whittled to zero. But the truth was, during this interim period, because like you said, it's a zero-sum budget, Everybody else had to chip in. All the paying owners had to chip in so they could pay their electric bill and their manager and, and all the related costs. So uh, back in 1999, when the legislature made this change, it seemed, to me it sounds like because the appellate court said, well, it's got to be in your governing documents. The legislature is not stepping up and being counted for it. Well, this is what we agreed to in 1999. Right. And that's the problem with the Senate Bill of 551. I mean, the whole intent of the legislature, uh, of the legislation, was to confirm that the legislature did truly intend that to happen. And the documents relating to what happened in 1999 supports that. They knew that the associations needed to do these non judicial foreclosures in order to assist them with their cash flows problem. They also knew that by putting it in, in, in the ordinance, I mean, in, in the statute, that there was no document. Uh, between the uh, 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 a contract between the the unit owners and the association with this power of sale language in it, like there would be in a mortgage. So they knew they knew what they were doing, and they truly intended uh, that the uh, associations, you know, uh, could do the non judicial foreclosures. And that's why, uh, you know, uh, by not passing five five one and saying that we really intended that to happen. Uh, they are doing a disservice to the associations because now what's happening is that the associations uh, who, who allowed uh, non-judicial foreclosures to happen between uh, 2008, I think, and 2011, which is the crucial time period, right, before the law changed again in 2012 uh, to, to fix some of the, the situation. The, that's the exposure period. And so, so those associations will now get sued and, and a lot of the claims are frivolous because, you know, the, the claims, I mean, the people who are doing the suing don't dispute the fact that they owed the association money. They were delinquent. And, you know, so the, the bottom line is, is that uh, the, the legislature, I think, needs to own up and say that they really intended for this legislation, uh, you know, the, that uh, the, the uh, non-judicial foreclosures uh, to happen. Uh, so the opponents of this bill, that I see the testimony, appear to be a couple of law firms that sue associations for the wrongful foreclosure concept, as mm -hmm. we described. And then they have three or four clients they're bringing down to the legislature. We're saying, poor me, I owed the association just a little money, and they foreclosed and took my home away from me. But, and that's what kind of was 
the legislature is hearing right now. So uh, wh what's your experience with that? My experience is, is you know, the, the, they don't dispute that they were delinquent and that, that, that they weren't paying their maintenance fees. And I think, you know, people need to understand that, you know, in a condominium, everybody has to pay their fair share. Otherwise, the people who are paying end up subsidizing the people who don't pay. And that's not fair. And, and when you buy into a condominium, I mean, you kind of expect that your neighbors, everybody in the building is going to pay their fair share, and you're not going to be stuck holding the bag, so to speak. And, 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 and so when you uh, have a situation here where the associations, you know, took, uh, took aggressive steps to try to make sure that there was sufficient money, you know, in the pool to make sure that the building, uh, the condominium could uh, operate. Uh, you know, they should not be penalized years later. Because here it is in 2019, and we're talking about lawsuits for non-judicial foreclosures that happened between 2008 and 2011. And to, to me, uh, what would be fair is what the Senate Bill uh, 551 tried to do is to say, we really intended, you know, back then uh, to allow the associations to do non-judicial foreclosures even if they didn't have that language in their governing documents. And we did it on purpose. We did it to help them. And, 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 and if this is causing a problem, then we should do it on a going forward basis and change the law to require them to have those, uh, that language in their governing documents, not going retroactively and saying, well, you should have known better. And, well, and that's not fair. Well, what frustrates me about this is, is that I go to the legislature and I'll see this innocent homeowner get up and say, poor me, I wanted to make a payment plan, my bad road board wouldn't work with me, and they took my home. And so I'm not going to give names on the show, but so I went and looked at one of the people who testified that way, and I got their records out, which showed, number one, the person was delinquent. The association offered them twice to make a payment plan. They did not refuse and did, or did not answer, did not reply did not make a payment plan, quit paying their mortgage as well. After a while, the associate, he went back to the association and said, well, give me another chance. The association gave him another chance. He still didn't comply or make a payment plan. And finally, on the eve of foreclosure, when he owed almost $40,000 in delinquent maintenance fees, he said, well, let me make a payment plan offer to you, which would have taken at no interest 46 years for him to pay off the initial judgment which the association couldn't accept. But they're out there telling the legislature, oh, it's the bad board, I'm a good person, yeah, I ran into some hard times. But it doesn't seem fair to me that all the rest of the owners should suffer. I certainly respect that person may have come across some hard times, but doesn't excuse his contractual obligation to pay his share of the cost. Right, and, and to punish uh, the boards for, uh, for relying on, on, a, on a law that they thought was valid, and all of us thought it was valid. And to, to, to now say, oh no, well, we changed our mind. I, and to make it uh, invalid retroactively is not fair. And so if they're going to make it invalid, they've got to do it on a going forward basis, and to me, that's more fair. And, and I think that's what you know, some of the controversy uh, is regarding this bill is because the, the way uh, some of the legislators are talking now they're going to say, oh, well, no, it wasn't valid back then. But then there were hundreds of associations who, uh, in reliance on the fact that the words are in the statute, and the, the words in the statute said that associations could do non-judicial foreclosures. And so now the, the legislature say, well, we really didn't mean it. To me, that's not fair. Okay, we're going to take a one-minute break. I have a lot more questions about this. We'll be right back, we'll be right back to Condo Insider to talk more about non-judicial foreclosures, power of sale foreclosures, and the negative impact on associations. We'll be right back. Hi, I'm Rusty Komori, host of Beyond the Lines on Think Tech Hawaii. My show is based on my book, also titled Beyond the Lines, and it's about creating a superior culture of excellence, leadership, and finding greatness. I interview guests who are successful in business, sports, and life, which is sure to inspire you in finding your greatness. Join me every Monday as we go beyond the lines at 11 a.m. Aloha.
Hello, I'm Dave Stevens, host of the Cyber Underground. This is where we discuss everything that relates to computers that's going to scare you out of your mind. So come join us every week here on thinktechhawaii.com, 1 p.m. on Friday afternoons. And then you can go see all our episodes on YouTube. Just look up the Cyber Underground on YouTube. All our shows will show up. And please follow us. We're always giving you current, relevant information to protect you, keeping you safe. Aloha. Aloha, welcome back to Condo Insider. I'm Richard Emery, your co-host, and I'm sitting with my co-host, Jane Sugimura. We're talking about this critical bill, Senate Bill 551, which has got potentially great harm to associations. Um, and we were talking about the appellate court ruling. So just describe again briefly, we've been doing non-judicial foreclosures since 1999. Yes. It's been a common practice to prevent associations from having greater financial harm and having to subsidize the non-paying owner. What was the basic ICA appellate court ruling? The basic ICA uh, appellate ruling uh, said that uh, the non-judicial foreclosures uh, uh, couldn't be done because uh, there was no uh, um, uh, right, the language, the power of sale language was not in an agreement that was binding between the unit owners and the associations, like it wasn't in their bylaws and it wasn't in their declaration. Like the power of sale uh, foreclosures that are you know, used with uh, mortgages, it's in the mortgage, which is a contract between the lender and the borrower. And in, con in condo land, the contract between the unit owner and the association are the bylaws and the declaration. And so the ICA is saying, in retrospect, it should have been in those documents, not in the statute, except that in other states, and I think it, this, it, 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 you know, it's in the appellate briefs, you know, there's a number of states on the mainland that have statutory provisions that allow for non-judicial foreclosure, and it's not in the governing documents, it's in the statute. But isn't the issue, and why this bill is important, is because the ICA appellate court basically said the intent of the legislature is not clear. Right. And that's what the SB 551 is trying to say. It was our intent back in 1999 to allow non-judicial foreclosures, whether or not it was in the governing documents. Right, that's, that's exactly what it is, the Senate Bill 551 is all about. And you know, the, the, the committee reports you know, for that legislation back in 1999, it does specifically indicate that you know, the purpose of that change, the, the language that they put in there was to allow associations to do non-judicial foreclosures. And, you know, so, and I was there, I was present, I was in the room back in 1999 when we were uh, debating this, you know, on, in, the, in the legislature. And I can attest to the fact that they, they really intended uh, to, to allow, they put that language in to allow us to do non-judicial foreclosures. And, you know, for now, for this, you know, legislature now to say, oh, well, uh, we're not really sure. I mean, to me, that's not fair. I mean, here are people who, who weren't there, but the, the records that document, you know, what happened back then clearly show that there was an intent. And the people, and I wasn't the only one who was around back then, who recall that it was, you know, that the legislature specifically intended uh, for us to uh, use that language to do non-judicial foreclosures. And to, to say now, almost 20 years later, oh, well, you know, there's an issue as to whether or not there was an intent to allow you to do that. I don't think it's fair. Well, I know that I've already seen a, a dozen lawsuits because of the ICA ruling. So let's talk about the financial risk and the harm to the association. So if this doesn't pass, what happens? I mean, the, gonna... the, 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 the associations who did non-judicial foreclosures between 2008 and 2011 are going to get sued. And I, I have a friend who lives in, a, in one of the uh, units who got, I mean, one of the associations who got sued. And, you know, she says that, you know, it, it's costing thousands of dollars, you know, and there's not a whole lot they can do because, you know, the ICA is basically saying that they couldn't have done the, the non-judicial foreclosure. And so they're the, 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 the uh, you know, the, they basically have to settle that lawsuit after spending, you know, thousands of dollars not getting any type of resolution. And they were ready to, the, the court had it set for trial. 
and wh why you know and uh, why spend thousands of dollars more you know to litigate you know uh, the issue and so they settled it but it cost them a lot of money so someone's going to have to pay that owner who was foreclosed upon some money and probably pay the attorney fees right that, is that on top of the settlement right is the insurance company going to pay any of this i don't think so i think there's i'm i'm being told the association's paying for it and so that means that you know they end up having to pay the settlement and in in this case i mean they had to give the unit back because they had foreclosed and the lender had not or the lender had in, filed a foreclosure but had not completed it so they ended up giving the unit back to the uh uh, unit owner, it's been 10 years. We're talking about a foreclosure that happened in 2010. Okay, a non judicial foreclosure. And so here it is, uh, 2019, and it's just settling now. They're, they had to give the unit back to the, uh, and they had to pay a monetary settlement. And they had to pay the lawyer. Legal and they had to pay the lawyers, and they had to pay their own lawyer. Oh, yeah. the, no, their lawyer was paid for by the insurance company. Okay, but then they, ha you know, their insurance premium went up. So it doesn't, it just doesn't seem fair to me that the legislature passes this law and everybody follows it and does what they think they're supposed to do. But now the non-paying owner and his lawyer, because I've seen ads in the paper where lawyers are running ads, if you were foreclosed upon, call me, you know. And, right. uh, and I think it's we're not talking just a small percentage. We're talking tens of millions of dollars of risk or a condo association. You're right, and it's, we're talking frivolous lawsuits because there's no dispute. These people, these plaintiffs who are suing the associations are not saying that they weren't in default. They're saying, yeah, we were in default, but we tried to make a deal and, and you know, poor me. I mean, the association was mean and they wouldn't, you know, deal with me. And, you know, and those, those are all factual issues that have to be litigated. And now this, uh, if, if, uh, the associations are going to get sued and they're going to be litigating facts that happened over 10 years ago. Because we're only talking about a narrow window between 2008 and 2011. Okay, that's over 10 years ago. So our audience understands, why is it only 2008 to 2011? What happened in 2011 2012, they changed the law uh, to uh, put, put the consumer protection provisions into non-judicial foreclosures, more notices, you know, in writing, more deadlines, and provisions about if you do this payment plan thing, you can't proceed with the lawsuit. And so, you know, they put in a lot of consumer pr uh, protection plans. And, you know, since, you know, one of the, one of the legislators, Ross Baker, uh, you know, for years, you know, she was very concerned with something called priority of payments policy. And she, she, she was, you know, she was of the opinion that because of that, a lot of associations were using that po uh, priority of payments policy uh, for, against people who were in default so that w when they filed foreclosure, it was basically based on late charges, legal fees, and fines. And so in last year, the 2018, and it took us a couple years to get that bill through, I mean, we finally passed that bill that got rid of the priority of payments policy. And, and I think that, that, you know, that Senator Baker was right, that it did lead to some abuses, and it did result in some foreclosures that shouldn't have happened, okay? And recognizing that, and then, you know, and I have to give her credit that she did something to try to fix the problem. And, you know, and we just haven't had enough time uh, to see whether or not the problem is going to be addressed because it only went in, the law only went into effect July of last year. But I think, we're, you know, because of what, Senator Baker did, uh, it, it's going to address a lot of the abuses and maybe minimize the amount of people who end up in foreclosure because they don't, you know, because of late charges and attorney's fees and, and whatnot. And I think, you know, that's, that's the more um, uh, responsible way to handle the concerns that are, you know, that, that some of the uh, people who are testifying about now are, rather than, you know, than Going, allowing them to sue associations for something that happened 10 years ago. Well, because we only have a couple minutes left, where does Senate Bill 551 stand now, and what do we need to do to help get it passed? It's going into conference committee, which means the Senate and the House will have send people to 
to discuss it. And for people who are in associations or unit owners or board members, if they want to help, they need to contact their legislators. And they can email them or call their offices and say that they support Senate Bill 551, the original House version or the original Senate version, but not the version it is that right now. And they need to do it quickly because the conference committees will start in about a week. Well, I think that's important. I know our industry is going to be emailing a lot of owners about please send in testimony and support of the original uh, Senate Bill 551, either the House or Senate version, although we're hopeful we can get what they call a CD1 put in place that helps correct this. But I don't think people realize that because of this period, 2008 to 11, if your association's in that where you've used non-judicial and they sue you, you're going to be taking money from reserves in your operating account to pay off these judgments meaning you're going to have to pay more money in legal fees and not legal fees and in, in maintenance fees or in addition more in insurance premiums right. all because of a non-paying owner taking advantage that the appellate court has said well we're confused by this where until that ruling came down nobody else was confused about this right any final comments no but i i think that this, this is a terribly unfair situation uh, where, where you, you have people who relied on the, the statute, which the legislature passed. And, and, and for now, for this current legislature to, to, to uh, waffle, you know, that's the only term I can think of, waffle, and say, well, geez, you know, we're, we're not really sure if they really intend. I think that's terrible. I, you know, uh, the, the documentation is there that the legislature in 1999 truly intended to allow associations to do non-judicial foreclosure. They should not open the door and allow uh, you know, people to uh, file these lawsuits because uh, uh, the current legislature uh, won't uh, that, uh, you know, uh, confirm the legislative intent that happened back in 1999. Well, I want to thank you for being here as usual. It's always fun to talk to you about these things. Not so much fun today, though. Yeah. I want to thank our viewers for watching Condo Insider. The beautiful view behind us is the Alawai Boat, Boat Harbor, I think. But uh, either way, we're going to probably talk about that and the redevelopment plans in the upcoming weeks. And in the meantime, send an email to your legislature. You support SB 551. You don't want to pay for other people's non-payment of their bills. Thank you for watching Condo Insider. We'll see you all next week.